Now, she is one of the world's most influential campaigners. She's interviewed politicians, written for Vogue magazine, even made speeches in front of royalty. But until today, you probably haven't heard of her. Well, I have to admit, I haven't heard of her, and I'm really looking forward to talking to her. She's Bella Lack. She's 17 years of age. Um, in comparisons, Bella, they, they say you're Britain's um, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, really. is that? It's lovely to see you, lovely to talk to you. Um, is that how you see yourself? Um, well, thank you very much for having me. Um, actually, no, I, I don't, because often the media, they do this a lot with... Um, with young activists, they sort of make it conflate every young activist with Greta Thunberg. And I think it's a bit of sensationalism in a way. It's sort of a, a climate activist reality show conflating, um, you know, Greta's parents or what Greta wears with the melting of ice caps and with the extinction of species. I so, I mean, I understand it, it's an easy title to put on there. Have you met Greta, Bella? I haven't, no. I worked with her on some campaigns, but I haven't met her. She came to London and I was actually in the countryside at the time, unfortunately. Bella, could I ask you, why, why are you getting the attention? Why are people listening to you? Because, you know, to have someone who we can focus on, who gives a message that the rest of us should listen to, why you? Why are they listening to you? Um... You know, I wouldn't say it's, it's me in particular. I think there's, there's a very powerful message we're pushing and there's a huge youth movement at the moment and that surged in the past few years. And when I began, I was sort of, I felt quite ostracized because I, I didn't see many other young people reflecting this passion I had. And then the youth movement grew and grew. And now there are many, many young people in the media pushing the message and not only young people, you know, there are many um, scientists, many campaigners and the message is always the same. It's unite behind the science. So I would say to people, um, don't focus on me, don't focus on Greta. It's not about the messengers, it's about the message that we're pushing. And how old were you, uh, Bella, when you, you started to become interested in this subtopic? And, and was it one particular thing that sparked your interest? Yeah, so I was 11 and I watched a video about palm oil and the effects on species, particularly orangutans, which I love. And many people think it's because I, have, I look a bit like one. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> it, it was that it was that recognition of the the destruction of a species I love so much. And when I began to campaign, I learned about the climate crisis, about extinction, and how they were so interlinked. So for me, it was sort of um, an obligation actually to do to do what I could once I learned about that. Bella, um, I'm a lot older than you. I'm three times older than you, um, and I'm a bit weary. I I devour, I watch every programme, I read magazine articles, but I worry all the time. I worry about the rainforest. I mean, only this week we read about more hundreds of thousands of acres being burnt down by property developers. I worry about plastic pollution. I worry about the oceans. I, I just end up... I'm not very optimistic for the future. I sort of feel mm -hmm. we're in a bad place and we're not going to get out of it, and I sort of feel the planet is doomed do you feel the planet is doomed? I mean, I'm not really a therapist, but I can, you know, we can be overwhelmed by the complexity of the problem or we can fall in love with the creativity of the solution. And I think so many young people are experiencing this new phenomenon, eco-anxiety. And of course, we're going to feel anxious when we see these UN reports saying, you know, we have 10 years to prevent catastrophic climate change. Um, but it's important to hold on to the fact that this isn't all about sacrifices. Environmentalism is also about solutions. It's about striving for a better future, where we live in cities which are actually much cleaner, where children can play on the streets, where we have more diverse parks and we can actually see the stars. And I think that's a future which we all want. And, and we saw during the pandemic, only 12% of people wanted to return to the normal as it was before, um, because the pandemic I think for us, it was sort of an MRI scan exposing inequalities and corruption, but it was also a portal. It showed us this um, world where we have much cleaner cities, where we have much more I, social I, cohesion, well, yeah, where we absolute, have wildlife. I absolutely agree with you on that, and I think we would have been two of the people who were saying that. Let's not go back to the way it was, but look what we've done. Mm -hmm. Masks, plastic masks, disposable masks, and people not sharing public transport anymore. Disposable um, cups again. Cup, yes, the idea that you can't wash cups and things that you've got to do. So really the pandemic, ironically, surely hasn't been good for the environment. I think it's a, it's a um, double-edged sword knife. 
it's a double-edged knife because that you know we've seen there are disposable masks, but um, in Paris there's been a huge green wave. Many green mayors have been elected. They've implemented huge bike lanes. Amsterdam is um, striving for a circular economy. And it's not going, change isn't going to happen overnight. You know, what we have to do is change the whole narrative of humanity from one of consumption and growth to one where we live, um, where we strive for a much more circular economy. And it is not going to happen overnight, but things are changing and we, we have a lot more to do. You're right. And I think that's exactly why we need so many more people. This isn't, I'm, I don't even like calling myself an activist because it sort of separates me from everyone else when actually I'm just recognizing the scale of the problem and doing some things which I think need to be done, which yeah. really I think everyone should do. You do so much. You do so much. You're the Youth Director for Reserva, the Youth Land Trust, Youth Ambassador for the Born Free Foundation, Youth Ambassador for the Jane Goodall Institute, Youth Ambassador for the RSPCA. You're 17 years old. You did your GCSEs last year, so going into sixth form. How on earth do you fit all that in with studies, with seeing friends and doing, you know, what other people say what, what a normal, if that's the word I could use, 17-year-old mm -hmm. would be doing? Honestly, not very well. Um, I was, the night before many of my GCSEs, I was out doing, I don't know, a panel or a protest and my parents were saying, right, you really need to focus on your revision now. Um, but anyway, I survived through them. And this year I was actually off school working on um, a documentary, so it's been a bit easier to focus on this, but I'm going back in September, so I guess I'll, I'll see what happens there. Do you know what? I think what you're doing is far more important than getting the odd exam, really, and mm. if people listen to you, that's great. And it's funny how, how you see um, things all being joined up and, and interconnected, which, you know, in a way, I suppose, could be, could be um, quite obvious, but you believe coronavirus is a byproduct of mistreating the planet. Could you explain that to people? How that, how you, and why you believe that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not, it's not a belief. It's been um, shown in many studies that you know the more we infringe into nature, especially in deep into forests where we haven't been before, then we um, weaken the buffer between us and viruses. And because 70% of emerging diseases are zoonotic, meaning they come from non-human animals to us, that really correlates with the fact that we're destroying nature um, at such a high rate. So I think, you know, the more we continue to weaken the natural world, the more we're weakening ourselves. We've already had SARS, we've had MERS, and now we have coronavirus. And it's going to get worse and worse and more extreme unless we drastically reduce how much we're um, impacting upon nature. Well, as I said right at the start, it's fascinating to meet you. It's fascinating to listen to you. It's fascinating to find out why you're a magnet for people, why people do want to follow you. But I suppose all those pluses bring minuses. And in this world of social media, you must have your detractors. Um, how do you deal with that? Um, you're right, there are, especially Twitter. I mean, Twitter is a really hostile place, but I think sometimes we see, at the beginning, I was really uncomfortable. I wasn't used to it at all. Um, and it is a bit of a sacrifice, but then again, um, you can see it a bit like um, a boat. The faster a boat moves in water, you know, the more resistance you feel from the water. And I, th I think the fact that young activists are receiving quite a lot of opposition is sort of testament to the fact that we're reaching people who haven't been reached before and our message is making people uncomfortable, which isn't always a bad thing um, because people are sort of having to step outside of this um, comfort zone which we've been in and recognise that we do have to change, we do have to make some sacrifices. Well, look, listen, it's been lovely yeah. talking to you. I, I hope uh, it's not long before we can invite you into the studio and uh, we can get uh, more up close with you and, and, and hear what you've got to say. Uh, keep safe, keep well and... Uh, Keep doing what you're doing. Bella Lack, thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so bye much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.